Hello guys, welcome to my chan as you can see in the picture today. We will start the part 1, what if Kashina x Makoto x Kagai x Tsunade. Kai's palace. It is said that there are times when to move forward, one must first look backward. In most recent years, this is a saying with which Kagai, the mother of Chakra, has become most familiar. Not the most agreeable lesson, but one she was forced to deal with nonetheless. It can't be helped. Kagai murmured. Her voice, pure and unearthly as one would expect of a goddess, held a sort of resignation. The Chakra goddess remembers her victory was blissful. Raising her arms to place her surviving enemies into eternal sleep had brought Kagaya even more gratification. Her once stolen power, the chakra long divided amongst the undeserving masses by her ungrateful spawn, was reclaimed at last by its rightful master. Reveling in the memory of her hard-won victory, Kagaya laughs. Her bell-like voice was benevolent in sound. A glorious confrontation, generations in the making. In Kagaya's eyes, it seemed as though fate itself had bent to her will. My traitorous children, it's regrettable you resisted. How I must have failed you as a mother that is my shame. Of course, your betrayal was still your own. I was never completely lost, yet, not even reincarnation was enough for you to learn like I have. To choose correctly. Placing the cold thoughts of her lost family aside, Kagaya believed herself content. For a time she was. The peace and solitude of her dimensional palace were nice, it's just too bad the serenity couldn't last. Millennia after biting millennium. A silent ever-growing tedium came and went. Contrary to her original expectations, perpetual solitude wasn't the answer. It wasn't loneliness per se, that was the problem. Not with her loyal children black and white Zetsu at her side, but more the unbearable lack of stimuli and its crushing aggravation that couldn't be denied. Left alone with time for nothing but thinking, the moon goddess understood too late, perhaps a few better options might have been in order. An equal. Perhaps not in power, but understanding. Though long aware of the concept, these other worlds are those alternative existences loosely intersecting with her own. For millennia they were nothing more than a passing curiosity. A seemingly irrelevant novelty she'd long ignored. Only now that she's trapped in this endless monotony, did it finally occur to Kagaya to take a look. If nothing else my counterparts could prove to be true and worthy companions. Growing more excited at the idea, Kagaya built up the potential in her mind. The possibilities are surely infinite, my victory in each land must vary as well. I can't wait to see the differences in how each Hagoromo met his end. Unfortunately for the moon goddess, her investigatory spirit was met with only horror. All too quickly she discovers herself an outlier, the singular face of victory in comparison to potentially millions of failures. The further Kagaya explored the more tiresome and humiliating it became. Realizing she faced defeat thousands of times across many worlds and only one single victory. Goddess of nothing. Really this wasteland. Appulsed, the mother of Chakra decided it best to analyze the many failures of her counterparts. No deep breaths all right, the next one, where exactly did things go wrong here? In doing so she began to notice a recurring theme. The founding of Kanoha again could such a simple branch truly be the cause? Yes and no. Will the elemental villages play a role? The truth is more complicated. As the Vex Kagaya would realize, though it is true that to an extent the Shinobi controlled elemental villages often mark the beginning of her alternative selves and, certainly for her only loyal children, black and white Setsu, that's only part of it. But of course, there's always more to history isn't there. More specifically the founders and their consistently inconsistent conduct and overwhelming failures of leadership. That is the true breaking point. It inspired people who are capable and drove them against me, the one whom they owe most. With this realization Kagaya applied herself. Examining history all the closer, ever so gradually she pieced together exactly where her counterparts met their specific turning point, and ever so gradually, a new better plan began to emerge. Rummaging carefully about these other worlds and learning the habits and desires of shall we say key players Kagaya's new plan could begin in earnest. We can live together in harmony Hashirama send you as a fool, but I can agree with him there. But peace and complacency are not one and the same. I can magnanimously share my power, but it will be under my terms. Carefully hijacking many unique world-specific black and white setsu each counterpart eventually merged within her own, these variant instruments of Kagaya's will were brought to her side, and with them came certain prizes. From one world the genius soars to him in his mental and emotional prime. Another the stillworm corpse of a young Mido Yuzumaki, murdered in many worlds by Kagaya's loyal sons. Preventing her favored political status from bestowing any further legitimacy to Hashirama's claim. His political power more than halved. Mido's father Kai Yuzumaki taken alive for a time, but his use expired all the same. Marked for inevitable death because his family seals are undeniably the root cause of Kagaya's jubi being splintered and weaponized into tools of war. Spare me your indignation Kai, I am merely collecting the toll. For your family began an arms race that kills thousands of innocents. Please be grateful, your death it has meaning here. A youthful Kashina Yuzumaki the mating. Snatched away from her Kumo attackers, seconds before her relentless stalker Minato could win over the volatile Redeed's affections by playing hero. Makoto Ichiha gracious new mother. Stolen from her bed mere hours after giving birth to a certain weasel. Both her renowned delicate beauty and the ancient power within her noble line will lend themselves nicely to the template. 
Sunade Senju cut down alongside her degenerate teammate Jureya, before their status-sanctioned crimes against Aim in Kagaya's eyes. This unsedestined crone is perhaps the most important ingredient to her plan. Another crucial piece to the template, her control and efficiency in expending one's chakra are invaluable. As is the latent potential for wood release. All these fragments and more they form the basis of a trick a wacky prank if you will. A well-defined path that can only end with a new and improved shinobi world happily bound before her. Or at least one version. Well, there's always room for expansion Kagaya Muse. Less relevant to the plan, but oh so amusing to Kagaya are the many a dead Taburama, mostly because his pompous arrogance irritates her. As her youngest son, Black Zetsu places the freshest corpse with the others, out of habit, Kagaya examines the mutilated body in silence. Satisfied with what lies before her, she mockingly pondered aloud. What has this monster done to warrant such an ego I know propaganda is effective, but these suckled forbidden techniques they have brought more harm to his people than good. It's truly a wonder he didn't spread them around, so the users would kill themselves and spare his loyal shinobi the bloodshed. At least then the many dead test subjects he experimented on wouldn't have died in vain. Dismissing these and other distractive thoughts, she turned her attention to Arachimer, far on the other side of her domain. Encompassing the eastern wing, there his lab resides. Within contains all Arachimer's fixtures and data, collected from many periods, and perfectly recreated in this one convenient place. Boldly striding within, Kagaya is straight to the point. Arachimer. Pardon my intrusion, but time is short. My curated world is just about where I need it to be, I assume you have everything in order. Absolutely. Without a doubt, the vessels for your children are just about perfect. You'll find them adept in concealing the boy's shall we say unique origin. His voice softens, Arachimaru's tone inquisitive. She too is also about ready. Ah oh yes, the girl like Inker, she will do nicely. Merely a toddler, yet already an ingenue in the making dare I say to Arachimaru by the time she is 17 half the battle will already be won. Arachimaru shifts, Kagaya wouldn't describe his posturing as uncomfortable, but he's definitely not at ease like she prefer. Before she can comment and attempt to soothe his nerves, he responds smoothly, his usual deliberate hiss absent. I agree. No matter whom she chooses for a partner, the resulting lineage will only contribute to your otherworldly counterpart's stable rebirth. Though I think we all agree it's best she aims high as possible. Better the deck be stacked in her favor. Looking at the shortest glass tube, the container holding a slumbering child floating in a sickly color liquid. Kagaya smiles brighter. Arachimaru notes that for the first time, which is known Kagaya he's seen complete sincerity in her silver eyes. She is calmer than before. Ten years we've collaborated and only now. Her words jolt him out of his nostalgia. You have done well. My expectations are more than surpassed. As promised, once I enter my chamber for slumber, you may claim your reward. Inclining his head lightly, Arachimaru is a bit more deferential but still proud. I appreciate it. It's a pity so many had to die. Nonetheless, these final maiden, mother, and crone variants your children gathered will make fine subjects for my own improved vessel. I only wish the boy could have survived too. Poor dear, you know I spared your world's tsunade just for you right it's not your fault, her brother died. The warhawk was never going to let Noaki live. Dan too. You kept them both alive a few good years longer than any other alternate, but the sad truth is that neither had the power to thrive in earnest. It was beyond your control. I get it, I've seen those other worlds. I am grateful at least my tsunade isn't walling quite so hard she and Shizun actually dropped by Kanoha. Not often, but it's preferable to the countless alcoholic disasters. Swiftly moving the subject matter, Arachimaru is more firm. Now then, I have some final tidbits of note, see for yourself. Handing the stack forward, Arachimaru's passion for his art leaks through his attempted at stoicism. As we hoped, enforcing them from recessive to dominant, the true potential residing within the ancestral abilities buried in the donor cells, lent themselves even more efficiently to your children's revised template. Under his breath, he murmurs, they will do the same for me. So I see. Remarkable efforts all around. Successfully incorporating the Uzumaki adamantine chains from Kashina was a nice touch. Such a rare ability, even amongst her family. It's bad enough my Byakugan had to be suppressed, I was worried something more would have to be sacrificed. Naturally, I went out of my way to avoid that, it's regrettable, but the Byakugan ties them to the ghastly Hyuga clan, and we can't have them hounding the children. They'd force that appalling caged bird seal upon their forehead and reduce them to slaves of the main household. Oppositely so, the adamantine chains will prove paramount in legitimizing their supposed truth of origin. Their hair is close enough, but the children lacking the famous Yuzumaki violet eyes will be impossible to miss. Interjected Kagaya. Yes, I'm aware Lady Kagaya. They bear roughly 15% Yuzumaki blood, but without the visual cues, it's too easily missed. The hint of red in their hair isn't enough. We'd be risking accusations of slander and deceit. In this way, their story can't be perceived as anything but the truth. How could it not be the Yuzumaki noble household will be left humiliated? Humiliated yes Sarachimaru, but not removed from the picture entirely. For the best really, they aren't without use, and we don't want genocide of our own making. That's a tactic best left to our lessers. 
something to publicly shame them for and turn their remaining allies towards us. Humming a deceptively gentle melody, Kagaya studies the offered notes, additionally confirming the flawless Mokujin wood and ice chakra present in her three perfect hybrids, though not to the same extent. That would be impractical. Kagaya hummed at the thought, the biting snowstorm for dear Shuroyuki, galloping lightning for sweet Riaiji and eternal blooms of infinite potential for Sakir. Alone they are great, worthy of reverence, but together, my children will be unstoppable. My traitors too this could have been you as well. Why did you choose your miserable father? After a time she feels Rachimaru's stare. May I help you? Oh I'm merely curious. Have you thought of a name, for your counterpart Suntub mother? I've been cooperating with you for years. I saw as you chose Shuroyuki and Riaiji with such care, I can't help but wonder. I try to be more careful with her. When she looks at me, she sees only an illusion of her mother. The Senju Chuha hybrid. Despite the gilded cage, as a prisoner, she wouldn't be particularly close to children fathered by her captor, and I'm keeping to that role. It's really important to you that she be innocent him. Of course my snakeling, authenticity is key. I wouldn't risk her kind heart coming off as performative. That would jeopardize my aims. She will comply with her brothers because she has no reason to doubt. It's her truth. Now since you asked, indeed I have picked one. Saku the Itsusuki name is lost yet her blood belies an amalgamation of my own, plus the most idolized bloodlines. There is zero chance she and her dear older brothers won't well that's not yours to know. They know the plan, arrive from the waters of waves, a direct shot from the deadly whirlpools of Yuzushio. Accidentally expose their identity as the results of an Ichiha and Senju bastard mother and Kai Yuzumaki. Let them infer the selfish Yuzumaki lord, kept the poor girl as his unwilling plaything. So that's why you had me combing the beaches of the dead world so many variants and so few pearls to show for it. I feel stupid now, here I thought I must have done something to upset you. The coveted Yuzushio pearls will adorn their throat the protected chains, it's all further proof of their heritage. This black Yuzusuho pearl pendant must be for Riaichi, and the white pearl is obviously for your Shuroyuki. Although I see nothing for the girl. Her gift is already accounted for Rachimaru, make no mistake, I am not favoring the boys. She is too young, but they know that when the time is right to present Sakuya with this. Looking closely at the circle of perfectly symmetrical white and black pearls, the silvery links of chakra metal between the pearls. Every link discreetly etched with protective engraved seals, the scientist retracts his ill-informed disapproval. I see, by the time this surfaces, they'll have heard years of denial, but with something so incriminating. Yes, for in the world I've so carefully chosen, it's been missing from the treasury for years. Poor Kai, when this comes out, his closest friends and allies won't believe him. There's a way for him to make the best of, let's see if his pride allows it. Seeing what Kagaya implied, Arachimaru shakes his head. You are concerned this could be taken as an act of redemption, someone might think it romantic, and decide the children's mother wasn't actually a captive, but a willing consort. The children won't confirm either way so it doesn't matter. Besides in the eyes of civilians, even if you love them, it doesn't change the fact he's still called for their death. Ah, without a doubt the pity the civilians will feel for the six-year-old twins, and the little sister they dote upon, it will feel their worry. Even if I'm wrong Rachimaru, what matters is that through their compassion and concern for the most vulnerable, we'll arrange these innocent children's transportation to safety. That much is a certainty. Far away from the cowardly family who threw away their mother once his legitimate daughter Mido and her mother threatened to expose their existence. Above all, the budding resentment they already feel for the privileged Yuzumaki name will tip, discrediting their influence. If only a little. I see Lady Kagaya. If I could be so bold I assume that from there it's on our little Shuroyuki and his fraternal twin brother Riaiji to handle the rest. Going by the specifics of what you had me inscribe on their new hereditary imprint, the Biju of that universe will gradually disperse, their energy solidifying Sakuya and both her brother's bodies. None can assassinate them. Turning her head Kagaya looks him in the eye. And what else I'm sure you aren't finished. Releasing a hiss like sigh, Arachimaru whispers. And pass the reformed Jubi forward through their resulting families. Well look at you my snakeling, you figured it out. Not that it was supposed to be a secret. Kagaya gently chided. One of the first things I shared with you Rachimaru is that this world's Mido won't live past her 20th year. And that Taburama Senju will die in Izuna Ichiha's stead. Erased from history just as he intended for the Ichihas. It doesn't take much to infer steps 3 and on. I'm not complaining Lady Kagaya, it will be fascinating to observe the continued war. From the safety and stability of my own world of course. Naturally, my darling Snackling has earned his promised reward and more. Upon your return, you'll find the position of Hokage all but yours. Claiming it will be but a formality. My boys personally ensured the biggest annoyances are already taken care of. A fatal heart attack for Homer, a stroke paralyzing more than half her body for hypocritical Kaheru, an old reliable pulmonary embolism for your traitorous Warhawk. Believe me Lady Kagaya, I am far from ungrateful. I've observed that with his teacher dead and precious Kashina M.I.A., poor poor Minato has been floundering. He is no threat to my ascension and never will be. It's always nice to focus on the positives, just don't forget your image. Ever. The people need a strong capable leader that much I agree, but above all, they must be able to trust you. 
be their beacon of trust and transparency. For that end I offer you a final presence. A permanent doorway to my palace between worlds. Here you will be free to continue learning as much as your heart desires. I only advise you to keep any and all of your more questionable experimentation to the dead of these many failed existences. You won't be hurting for cadavers as the corpses here remain fresh as the day they stopped breathing. Of course, you have my word. Now then I think it's about time. I assume you don't require my presence and I best be on my way. Wishing him a life of satisfaction and dismissing her kind as sort of son, with a nod, Kagaya calls her two deserving children black and white to her side. Releasing a breath of anticipation Kagaya murmurs to herself. Finally, at long last, it's finally time. Carefully assisting them with the binding into their new hybrid bodies, and guiding them through bathing, Kagaya eases their silent worry. Ryaiji and Shiroyuki, my true children you who never betrayed me. This will not be easy. I wish I could do more to comfort you, but in truth, you will be among enemies. At least for the time being. The biggest note of relief is that your alternate counterparts won't be too much trouble. These vessels can't hinder your innate connection, so absorbing them into yourselves shouldn't be any different from before. Still, due to the restrictions on your new forms, the battle will be ugly. Please remember, these bodies are that of children, human children. I know as mine you're each many times stronger than ordinary mortals, but I urge you to delay. Avoid confronting them as long as possible. It's your decision, but perhaps after the one tail is assimilated maybe the two tails as well, just to be sure. Cuddling them into an affectionate embrace, she whispers fondly. Please just be cautious. It's not worth the risk. You three are a sacrifice I'm not willing to make. Now then take good care of your sister, Sakuya needs you both just as you will need her. I cannot overstate it, no dying on each other understand. Sacrifice anything else if necessary, but never each other. The early beautiful little boys before her nod, the sincerity of their devotion radiating off in warm comforting waves of warmth. Once again Kagaya finds herself pleased that her choice to treat them with more maternal affection than most of her failed counterparts, has borne such delicious, loyal fruit. Although it seems these new bodies are making it a bit more pronounced. Ah well, better for me and them. This childish innocence can only benefit their situation. Let's go over it once more. Shiroyuki, as the eldest brother, when they ask, who is your family, what will be your response? Punching his left fist the boy brightens, his smile positively angelic, I tell them our father is Lord Kai Uzumaki. Mama is just Mama, Sora doesn't know her family, but her eyes turn red like blood. Very good Shiro. Straight to the point and very much a child's answer. Now Ryaiji, what is the reason you three are fleeing the Yuzu Whirlpool village? Looking thoroughly distraught, Ryaiji faces the ground, his shoulders trembling. Mama says our big sister Mido made Papa choose between her and Aika Yuzumakiros. He chose them cause they're his real family. Disgraces to their noble legacy must be purged. Mama helped us escape on a boat, but lost her life in the process they two Tomo Shuringen flashing in his eyes, presumably awakened by the horrible ordeal. Excellent performance sweet Ryaiji, just try to keep it on the simpler side. This applies to you too Shiroyuki don't use such eloquent phrasing. Remember to these people you are lost children in need of protection. An oppressive power unjustly targeting you for reasons, not your fault. To better emphasize your innocence, hold back on the more explicit detail, it's usually better to let them draw their own conclusions. Only a truly independent investigation will find a hidden corpse of Senju and Ichiha blood. There, the template sword will be exposed as you mother, and that highly traumatic and most incriminating discovery will begin the Yuzumaki alienation, creating the crack-like rift connecting to the distant warring air, the sound of roaring tides impossible to ignore, Kagaya keeps them calm. Tucking a loose blood minkler lock behind Shiroyuki's ear, and ruffling the shy, giggling Ryaiji's bangs, she smiles with a soothing, maternal air. It seems our time is up, remember as follows. Handling a squirming Sakuya to Shiroyuki, Kagaya is calm. Erase Tabrama, ensure he isn't so much as a footnote in Kanoha's founding. Remove him from any heroic ties or associations. Exactly like he has done in so many existences to the Ichiha after they stopped being useful to his spineless brother. Two and most importantly, destabilize Hashirama Senju's path to power. Killing Mido Yuzumaki and disgracing her lord father Kaiyu as his ill-gotten bastards whom he tried to eliminate is a good start, but there are always alternative avenues worth exploring. If you, my children are so inclined you can help them mend their reputation later, absolve them through forgiveness or acceptance, but I suggest only bothering if doing so will further your aims. Naturally there is no obligation they do hold some legitimate blame for many of the world's problems. I wouldn't blame you for thinking any retaliation the civilians unleash could be acceptable. Still just remember, their full extermination is not on the table. So long as that line remains uncrossed, their fate should be of little concern to you three. I imagine Kaiyu's ego and the Uzumaki's need to keep face will surely prevent his direct interference. The rift before her is now big enough for the children to enter. Kagaya kisses each firmly on the brow and urges them forward. Though now, mother loves you with all her being and knows everything will be as planned. If you ever find yourselves faltering simply remember that as my children a part of me and our blood legacy is always with you. You have nothing to fear. So long as the two tasks are fulfilled, you may live your new lives as you see fit. 
Do with my blessings what you will. With these final words the three make their way inside, falling into the sea below their feet. Though relatively close to shore, the rippling tide sweeps them upward. The foamy sea is eager as always to claim new blood, but Kagaya is unconcerned. My darlings will be fine, the boys know I timed it to open, just as the fishing boats are making their return for the evening. They know their role and have never failed me. Contenting herself with reassurance and her confidence in their abilities, Kagaya smiles. Serene and joyful, her lips barely containing her rising anticipation. Striding toward her comfortable seating, a place Kagaya prepared for her slumber, the goddess's thoughts are full of content excitement. Let us see how my other self handles these curveballs, even if by some disaster she fails to allow herself to be reborn through my magnificent avatar, Sakriya, I win. By virtue of throwing everything asunder, I already won. All that's left is for my Riaiji and Shiroyuki to react accordingly. In one form or another Kanoha may very well come to exist, too bad for Hashirama Senju, his idealized will of fire is no more. At least in the way he envisioned on that day at the river with Madar. Slipping into a comfortable position for her sleep, a melody flows from Kagai's lips. In the dark night, twin blades glow, bearing hands know, fools can't know, waking dreams cease to be. Our new dawn begins, a miserable desert village along the borders of wind. Here in this dry place Black Zetsu is frustrated. no, wait he reminds himself again, it's Riaiji now. Mother gave us these new names and we will treasure them. Sensing the watchful eyes of the foreman, Riaiji attends to his image. Wiping imaginary drops of sweat from his brow, the porcelain-skinned boy is hard at work, only partially pretending to help dig the new well. It's an annoyance. Mostly because such a meager task is far beneath him, but also because it wouldn't be on it in the struggle if he were allowed to use any of his abilities. I wouldn't even need the elemental capabilities or the cultivated bloodline abilities afforded by this body. A simple chakra scalpel would do the job. That shack we saw for grabs is falling apart, but it's affordable and better than nothing. I refuse to live with actual orphans. Unlike them, our mother is alive. Father too if that Kai Uzumaki counts. Through his blood, or rather another version of him. A straining an unsightly fiendish grin, Ryaiji can't wait for the inevitable confrontation between father and children. Father certainly took well to the template sore. An artificial woman without true personality. Ryaiji recalls that she was created by the scientist to his mother's exact specifications. A puppet of flesh and blood. Bearing the Ichiha woman's refined beauty, augmented by the Senju blood of Hashirama's granddaughter, so far as Kayu could see, Sora lived for his approval. Even a single smile from him was enough to leave her a blushing mess. All in all, it took a disappointingly short amount of effort for Kayu to forget all about Aika and their daughter Mido. He willingly followed her to Mother's world. Riaiji mused disapprovingly. At least he had the decency to sign that wonderful, legal document for us to appropriate. It's not like they weren't happy for a time. Mother made sure of that, but no illusion is permanent. By the time these vessels were born, she couldn't be bothered keeping up appearances any longer. At least by then his purpose was fulfilled. Between his remains and Sora's ovaries, we had more than enough material for Sakuya's more handsome creation. Recalled the bemused Ryaji. It's almost a pity that the world he originated from couldn't house us alas, time moved forward there the year he was missing changed too much. It wasn't worth adjusting the plan to such a large degree. At least here in this comparatively blank slate Shiro and I hold all the cards. Will. He amends his thoughts. We will. In time. The sooner mother's vessel, or no that isn't right. The sooner our sister Sakuya can sing, the sooner we can put this pretense of vulnerability aside. This village is tiny, but a fair number of shinobi use it for rest. Sooner or later one of them will take notice of us, it doesn't matter whom. Secondhand memories of a certain degenerate master whom variants of himself and his brother Shiro had killed in so many worlds, flashed through his mind. Okay, maybe we can afford to be picky. We don't want a negative reputation, but let's not be too choosy, so long as brother and I are able to justify our skills, that's what matters. Sliding himself carefully down the widening hole, past another worker, Riaiji hunches his shoulders in a squirm. Making himself seem as timid as possible, his deceptive innocence already melting the foreman's heart. They're big-hearted fools, but the orphanage is too small and underfunded, I want us out quickly, and they'll be grateful for three fewer mouths to feed. This pocket change will go far. White Shoryuki Riaiji reminds himself. Shiro is right. He's looking after her and realizes that feminine wiles and chakra wielding aren't enough to impress. Not on their own, the target mother wants Sakuya's innocent heart to attain. It's annoying, but Shiro is right, he isn't like Kai Uzumaki, and Kanoichi are plenty common enough that there's no novelty in it. What's worse even if she wants to fight, that's years off. If we present this the right way, Sakuya's coveted lineage and capabilities in combat can be a pleasant bonus. Not the main allure, but rather a garnish that enhances her overall appeal. To that end, our Sakuya needs a niche now. And what better beacon for a barren wasteland like this desert hovel, than a songstress whose voice, blessed by divinity, can call forth the rain Riaiji thought mockingly. It's not even a lie. Mother stressed that the best deceit is rooted in truth. They will worship a Sakuya's altar, word will spread, and he will come to us. 
passing the water canteen he was entrusted with to watch over to the actual worker it belongs to, a bored Riaiji recalls the initial shock their arrival brought on the fishing village. It's really been over a month now since we left. Still soaked in sea brine, Riaiji was very careful about his observations. His usual gratitude for Shuroyuki extended to an all-time high after he agreed to keep the younger peon's sister Sachiko busy. Thankfully she was happy to dote on Sakuya, and Shiro's endless stream of excited rambling questions kept the men outside. All in all, Riaiji probably needn't have bothered. The rescuers weren't exactly subtle in their conversations. It's been hours and I still can't believe it, apprentice. Storm season is months away yet that rain came out of nowhere. If the torrent had begun even a moment, sooner these poor things would have drowned. Gesturing to the warming children occupying the lone spare futon, the apprentice fisherman Kyrie Chensi sighs. The timing is fortuitous I say, practically right as the girl began crying, the downpour. The fact neither noticed what Sakuya's cries brought upon, didn't relieve Riaiji. It does us no good till she can control it. Eh, look, master, let's just be proud of ourselves for getting to them into the semi-dugout in time. Catching his unprompted rudeness to his benefactor, Kyrie hastily corrects himself. It's all these years on the seas boy. One day this will be you. Still, I'm ashamed. There was no wreck I could see, but with how powerful the whirlpools are and who knows how long they were adrift, they're okay master. That sister of mine has them sipping a nice umami stock, go home to the missus and get some sleep. I have it for now and we'll decide on long-term plans in the morning. The long-term plans ended up being a hastily arranged borderline smuggling of themselves out with the aid of a traveling merchant. It wasn't difficult, Shiroyuki woke up the poor brother and sister with a nightmare. His adamantine chains the bloodline ability exclusive to the Uzumaki, exploded in all directions. Following Shiro's lead Riaiji himself joined in the fracas, his silver eyes glowing red, the infamous Tamo of his Shiringan spiraling wildly. His own chains hovering loosely above his head mingled with Shiro making a web. Poor Kairi was barely able to keep the sobbing Sakuya calm. Unknowingly avoiding another out of Sisson downpour, inferring the children would be trouble, that dangerous people might be looking for them. The siblings realize they are in over their heads. Terrified but ultimately too compassionate to do nothing, they decided it was best the kids be sent away. I don't want them here sister, they use a careful brother, these are children. I know, I know, they aren't responsible for their pompous family. But sister, it's them we're talking about. Kyrie's voice shifts to a whisper. Our village barely survived the last incident they dragged us into. Those warmongers will destroy us and feel nothing. Unaccustomed to his new body, it took all IG had to eavesdrop without it being obvious. I feel for them Sachiko, but if what I suspect is true where can they go, neither clan will want them. The Yuzumaki will deny them because their very existence is inconvenient, and the Ichiha will view their mixed blood as tainted. I agree brother, but there must be yes that's it, these children need anonymity. Not here of course, that's a disaster waiting to happen. I see their features stick out, but they don't have to do so. There are plenty of environments where they can hide in plain sight. Perhaps a place where hair coverings are common, and so it was hastily decided. A merchant who owed Kyrie a favor and had business in Wind's capital was contacted. After further hushed negotiations, which Riaiji wasn't privy to, it was agreed the burly man would drop them off in one of the many nondescript villages. Far from waves and more than far enough out of the way from civilization, nobody would be in a hurry to search there first. The merchant in question mostly kept his word. He was no more enthusiastic over the Uzumaki clan than the fisherman Kyrie, but he kept his word. Granted I'm sure he chose this poor outskirt out of spite thankfully it's more than enough for our needs. It's exactly the sort of place Sakuya can gain support. The boy smiled, his expression bright as the sun. The foreman gave him extra coin without thinking. Finally, she's gone. The haggard if well woman leaving him be, at last, Shiroyuki can resume Sakuya's lesson. Casually crossing over the stone floor to Sakuya's shared room, Shiro idly lets his thoughts wander. For just over a year now the siblings have been living within the sandstone walls making up the children's shelter. Though his younger twin brother Riaiji would surely disagree, it hasn't been terrible. The Young Wind Daimyo's pet project, locations like these are an increasingly familiar sight in Wind. Indeed Shiro suspects that so far as orphan homes can be, this place is surely on the higher end of any spectrum of quality, especially considering the rough inhospitable environment that is our location. Thought Shiro. All in all things haven't been unbearable, their plans are progressing, and so long as it is practical and he knows he can get away with it, Shiroyuki generally ignores both the matron Ryoko, and a dozen or so children, so misfortunate as to call the shelter of this sweltering village home. Carefully ensuring his indifference is framed politely and as deferential as he can manage, Shiroyuki is pleased with the results. If I'm not mistaken she's interpreting our disinterest as a product of shyness rather than malice or big head. Good, now if we can keep it that way. Appearances matter and it wouldn't do for me to be the cause of trouble. Still, despite his more charitable outlook, Shiroyuki isn't sure how much longer his own patience will last. Aiji is impatient but isn't completely off base, this way of life it's unsustainable. Something has to change. 
Mercifully enough, the many duties required in running the children's shelter keep those around them busy, and more often than not, the eldest brother is free to handle his time as he sees fit. Approaching the door keeping the youngest children, Shiro halts. Sensing an arc of annoyance, not his own, stab across his forehead, it can only be Ryaiji, formerly known as Black Setsu. Ryaiji is occupied this again, yet another unaffiliated fool trying to claim us. In broad daylight no less, must be another undesirable type otherwise Ryaiji would be happy to play along. Shiro realizes with annoyance. Observing through the two-way mental connection, Shiro shakes his head. It's nice to be recognized, even better that it's so open. But there are better ways to negotiate mother would be sickened. Feeling Ryaiji as he sinks into the ground via Kamui, an ability tied to the modified Shuringen. One of the many boons offered by their cultivated bodies, Shiro knows the battle is won. Ah uh, well, yet another body, never to be found. Stroking, the barely perceptible mark, discreetly tattooed behind his left ear, the weightless contents within the dimensional space are practically itching to be utilized. Ryaiji must be feeling the same. I know he's frustrated, but the tools within our respective storage seal can't be wasted. There's money, but everything from father's love poems to mother, and Sakuya's diadem, all have a purpose. These steps were chosen with care, we can't stray from the meticulously curated path mother lay before us. We have no way of explaining them. Worst case they confiscate them completely. It was hard enough convincing the matron to let us keep our pearl pendants. Sentimental reminders of our mama. Shuroyuki remembers. His musings were interrupted by a sliding stone door. A small girl with red blind locks and wide, long-lashed eyes of polished silver. She looks up at him, curiosity brimming white and uninhibited. Although her face and idealized features gazed expectantly, Sakuya's expression is still very much adoring. I knew it was you thank you for coming again. She said, accompanying her greeting with an unfairly graceful dip of the knee. Sakuya, you felt my presence. Wonderful efforts, but of course I returned, we're siblings. Come along now, I'll brush your hair and you can refresh my memory. I trust our lessons are sticking. The diminutive girl lights up further. Her white silver eyes practically sparking. Yes thank you, brother, I remembered everything from last time. I've been practicing hard. That's wonderful to hear a little sister. These different pitches are instrumental to your future. Thus far your grasp of the basics is sound, but for now, it's best to keep our efforts small. Taking his larger hand, Sakuya is energized. I know, we don't want a dedulic deluge. Shiro grins, taking advantage of the provided opportunity to indulge in their facsimile of familial warmth. Very good Sakuya. It's a tricky word, good on you for catching your air. Not many your age would understand. Now then, you remember correctly, but it's your intent that matters most of all. What you want more than anything is to call a sprinkle of rain. Something modest and manageable which these people can gradually grow accustomed to. A deluge as you say would turn them against us. Now let's get moving, after our lesson, I have a surprise for you a trip to see real dancers. Mrs. Ryoko will never know we were gone. Oh really Shiro bouncing on the soles of her feet, the girl is trying but failing to rein herself in. I'll never mislead you little sister. No matter what happens you'll always have Ryaiji and I leading her downstairs, to the few people around, Shiroyuki's face is neutral. None of the staff make an effort to chase them away. Ah, the perks of being known for good behavior, Shiro mused. As the two settle into their spot a secluded storage room beneath the shelter, Shiroyuki knows they aren't supposed to be here, but he doesn't exactly care. Nor do the caretakers really. Shiro speculates it's likely because the crates are bolted shut, so it's not like anything is in danger of being stolen by mere children. Placing herself on top of a smaller crate, Sakuya makes herself comfortable. Shiroki reveals the usual brush from his storage seal. Sitting himself behind Sakuya, he runs it carefully through her hair. The cascading waves easily take to the whalebone brush, and the rhythm of his movements is soothing. Now Sakuya, begin with our chant, show me how well your voice has come. Nodding slightly so as not to disrupt her brother's brushing Sakuya acquiesces. The smooth tranquil, verse without melody. Be the gentlest rainer steady pour, in my voice, a torrent roars. Blossoms sway and branches tall, my melody a gentle thrall. Sensing the gentle wood element chakra emanating the room, Shiro looks about. Ah, those blossoms in the corner weren't there when we entered. She's closer than I dared hope. Thought Shiro. His eyes flash with pride. The tiniest hint of greed, he can't yet repress is unnoticed by his sister. We might be able to begin soon him, let's see how far I can push. Very good Sakuya, it's a rudimentary chant, but effective for our needs. Now try again, but this time use a higher register. The medium register is adequate. But we both know you have more. Far more than most others could begin to dream of. Use it. The girl nods, I can, Lady Ryoko said the upper register is called soprano. I won't let you down, Shiro. Taking a breath, Sakuya resumes her chanting. In the mesmerizing soprano, even as additional tiny blooms spring forth, the previous haphazardly scatter. Hmm, I guess this stuffy basement isn't the best place for floral longevity. Still, this is good. I have plenty to work with. Mother your scientist did well. Shiro thought in gratitude. Yes, that's it. A beautiful sound Sakuya. From their hidden perch, Shiro notes Sakuya's attention on the dancers. 
Her single Tomo Shuringen commits every movement to memory. These are such a lovely point of reference, brother. I can build off this and work it into our voice work. He hums in approval. Excellent attention to detail. I see you noticed even the background dancers have something to offer. The girl blushes. Sakuya's appreciation for Shiro's praise is visible. A factor he is happy to encourage. So close, mother. I didn't even need to tell her to do so. She instinctively understood the purpose. Riaiji, we are nearly there. Once an unnamed forgettable outskirt now, a fruitful oasis village. A man, shivering in the shadows. The late evening breeze cuts about. Oblivious to the unseen danger drawing in upon him, the man inches forward from his position. Doing all he can to remain just out of sight. Only a bit further I can almost hear it's her again, finally. I can hear her. His fixation the beguiling figure upon the lake shore. Not mere songstress, but the wellspring maiden. Sakuya a veritable demigoddess who calls the oasis village her home. Though the entire village has felt her touch, it is this lake itself that has proven to be the greatest testament to her power. Once a glorified desert puddle masquerading as a pond, in the decades since Sakuya's arrival, her blessed voice gradually expanded the waters into the breathtaking vision before him. The final rays of the setting sun highlight the lush green blossoming anew. Not replacing what beauty remains from her previous night's songs, but strengthening and solidifying their roots. Under the wellspring maiden's voice, he once mostly barren, sandy soil now rendered fertile and ready to support life. Nearly sixteen, the power of her voice has brought upon a degree of wonderment and prestige their once outskirt town never dreamed possible. Today, no longer boonies barely getting by, but the beating heart of wind. An official report released by the daimyo's people, grudgingly conceded that Oasis's trade and quality of life surpassed the very capital, even more so since the Chibi One Tail monstrosity vanished. A phenomenon that left great confusion, but also undeniable relief in the people of wind. Grateful to no longer suffer its craving for blood. The intrusive man observes, his mostly silent all palpable. His hunger is greater than ever. The moonless beauty's worldless aria transitions to a full, haunting soprano. With her transcendent, otherworldly power vibrating about, emanating the very air and elements about him, the sensations tingle. The man's obsession blooms further. Unaware a fatal breaking point rests firmly in sight. To any observer, innocent or otherwise the wellspring maiden's orchestrated pitter-pitter of descending rain droplets is of no distraction. Saku's song is unimpeded. Exactly as yesterday and every day before. The man whispered. His breathing was deep and unsteady. To anyone nearby it's surely an unsettling sight. This is not the first night, and if he has his way it won't be the last. We all know she's going to be of marital age soon. A few years off, but once the floodgate begins, as if I'd have any chance, those brothers of hers they'd never let me be alone with her. Slowly creeping along the sides, the closer he reaches the more certain he becomes. I'm not playing fair, but I swear we'll be so happy his dark thoughts cut short, the man's world drowns in blackness. The IG is frowning. Disgusting. Sakuya's brother whispers. It's all he can do not to spit. Good, thank you Kina for keeping her company. I know brother, I'll be thanking our guests myself like she was your teacher, it's not my fault. Sure, my ice element isn't like yours. Just because I can doesn't know. Look it's a matter of practicality. Mother may not have said it, but I think her intention is clear. She wanted it to be your ace in the sleeve just as Sakuya's wood surpasses ours, and I'm the only one of us with a true lightning affinity. You know what I'm not having this conversation. I hate being the reasonable one. It's unseemly. Whatever. Restraining a rude gesture, Riaiji continues his distant mental dialogue. Not that Shiro would have seen it. Yes, everything is clear on my end too. I'll be at the manor soon. Verifying through their two-way mental link that his brother Shiro has escorted their perhaps overly gentle-hearted sister home, Riaiji turns his attention to the miscreant. Kamui. Sinking deeper into the moist dirt beneath his boots, Riaiji's mood is fell. His grip on the wall attacker's corpse loosens, the literal dead weight is released without ceremony. Unforgivable. You got off too easy. The crushed neck is nothing, not for a cretin like yourself. Fortunately for you, it's best for Shiro and me that our poor Sakuya be unaware. She would mistakenly blame herself, overanalyze her actions, and the darkness would be bored that could surely stain her heart. We need her to continue loving this place. Her bubble. A sanctuary to cherish and build a beautiful life. It wouldn't do for Sakuya to pine for its eradication. Crouching himself down at the body's side, Riaiji smiles. Never a smirk, Riaiji likes to consider himself far too kind to ever let out such an unsightly expression. Sakuya thinks so. Placing his pale glowing hands down on the body, a sinister blitter chakra seeps through. The Bijja chakra which Riaiji and his siblings have been gradually siphoning. It takes no effort, the scientist ensured the process occurs with or without our intervention. Riaiji remembered with glee. As Riaiji directs the incremental trickle of corrosive energy to devour the man's remains, he maintains the gentle protective face his sister has come to see as the real Riaiji. Outside his public mask, a most gentle, loving brother who never harms others without the strongest justifications. The Chibi Shukaku feast to your heart's content.
I know you are no longer capable of conscious thoughts or feelings, that your power belongs to me and my siblings. Regardless, I'm sure any faint lingering remnants of your persona will appreciate my sentiment. No need to fear loneliness, sweet Tanuki. Matabi is on her last legs. Best assured, our confused two-tailed kitten will be joining you very soon. Under the moonlight, Riaiji walks home. His pace casual, to any observer, his face has never seemed so beautiful. Sakuya sways elegantly about the room. Her graceful arms move delicately, keeping rhythm with her melodic voice. The gratitude her heartfelt song conveys for the children's shelter, and how grateful she is for all it did for her, seems almost tangible. Their song reached an ethereal, sunshine-filled climax. Irrefutable proof of her heritage, the Yuzumaki adamantine chains, comprised of golden light flow from behind her exquisite form. Rising and swaying at the ends, not unlike the regal tail feathers of an elegant peafowl. I wish upon a star, soaring forevermore. Surely I know it will reach you one day. Our heart's a symphony, you keep my soul so clean. Far from a song of love, I know I must believe no matter if stars collide. My heart's a symphony, melodies unseen, that's what you mean to me, the blessed, blessed moonlight. Sakuya's melody near its end, the shimmering chains gleam and transform. The glorious infusion of Sakuya's prize wood element poured forth, converting them into pleasing garland-like blossoms, entwining down her shoulders, and dangling towards the stone floor. I wish a symphony if we could stay as one. A song so sweet. Never too far apart, merciful love pulse forth the rising sun. In the embrace of night, I know I must believe a tapestry that can't deceive. Blessed, blessed moonlight. Sakuya dipped her head and shoulders down into a reverent bow. The captivated audience of smiling, transfixed children rose from their cushions to clap their small hands in delight. It was faster paced than I'm accustomed to, but they seem happy. Thought Sakuya. Please her anxious nerves didn't show. As the joyful children surround her for hugs, a pink cheek Sakuya says shyly. Thank you so very much. I've missed you all so much. And I'm glad we could spend this time together again. Shiro and Riaiji keep me busy I'm really sorry, I know once a week doesn't feel like enough. The sincerity of her devotion is visible to all in the vicinity. Though her attention is needed elsewhere before taking leave, she makes a moment for each little one. Her words were affectionate and encouraging, Sakuya presented each of them with both a sweet smelling bloom and a large juicy crimson apple, handpicked from a tree she grew in the renewed garden of her family manor. Sakuya patiently assured them she would return. I promise the same time next week. We'll read together and after I'll show you another trick from my brothers. Offering a final nod to her fellow former resident, Sakuya is gracious with her compliments. Thank you again for the accompaniment Rasa, your skill on the flute has come a long way. Please give A.M. my regards. In Sakuya's hurry to leave for her meeting, she didn't notice the flush on her old friend's cheeks. Her reminder of his beloved gave him a boost of energy. Hours later, in the early evening, but plans for a festival open to outsiders in motion, Sakuya finishes her busy day by visiting her friend Yukina. They meet at a popular icy drink stand where as usual Sakuya helps her close up before their evening trip to Sakuya's lake. More people are watching the normal outsiders again I hope I don't disappoint. Indeed, unbeknownst to the oasis residents, while their wellspring maiden calls forth their daily rain, it's far across the continent in Ichiha territory where the real drama unfolded. Fresh off yet another skirmish between themselves and the Senju, things are not going as history intended. I, I almost can't believe it Madar. It doesn't feel real. They said he was a prodigy. The young man's conversational partner scoffs. He's making no effort to conceal his derision for the dead man in question. Forgive my impertinence Azuna, but a prodigy doesn't die to friendly fire. His own brother's techniques no less. The younger of the two brothers frowns. Please, don't be so dismissive, it was an accident. It's anticlimactic, but such a thing is always a risk in war. Look I get it, you never cared for Taburama, but you did respect Hashirama. I think the least we can do is pay respect to his fallen brother. We have our debt to cremate, this presents us an opportunity. That's true Zuna, this isn't the time to be petty. It's just a shock. I'd never seen my old friend look so broken. Azuna nods. He's always been so bright, almost obnoxious. I would never believe this possible, but we all saw it. One moment Taburama was preparing an attack. His technique synchronized in tandem with Hashirama's. The next second, he was crushed by tree roots. Tragic for our rivals, but it won't stain our family to show a little grace. But the resigned Sai Madari Chihu relents. You're right of course. What would I do if it were you Zuna? I trust your little brother, make the call for a temporary ceasefire. His people won't agree, but Hashirama is bullish. He will force it through. Madara said firmly. The matter is settled. Release. Shouted a desperate Mido. To the Yuzumaki princess's rising despair, this isn't the relaxing, uneventful trip she anticipated. Despite Mido's greatest efforts to dispel whatever horrifying illusion has infiltrated her caravan, the newest vision of her respectful father laying his head upon a pregnant woman's belly remains before her eyes. This is impossible lies. It has to be. The silvery green of a hovering lunar moth makes no reaction to Mido's plea. Ten days earlier, awaiting her departure on the pier, Mido is contemplative. 
She has no idea who let alone why, but Mido knows in her heart that someone is determined to destroy her family. It's the only explanation. Every time things are about to improve for them, something goes wrong. Like the rising sun, this pattern of grace followed by ill fortune has followed her since childhood. At nine, my parents arranged for me to wed a borderline infant, then rumors of father's alleged infidelity are sparked. If that's not insulting enough, my name is drawn into it, and I'm perceived as the villain. She thought with frustration. Supposedly it's my fault some random children were cast out. Not a kind rumor, but I could have dealt with that. The problem is that these pretenders or whoever is protecting them understand how to appeal to the public. I'm not sure how exactly but they manage to look more legitimate by the day. If one more cousin tells me how blessed I am to have such marvelous siblings in wind again, that I should be proud, that despite our father abandoning them to die, the three have honored our blood, bringing Yuzumaki wisdom and authority to the desert wilds, it's maddening. Realizing she spoke loud, Mido gives an apologetic nod to her attendant. Brushing such thoughts aside, Mido sighs. Refusing to give the pretenders any more of her energy, she turns her attention to her gathered belongings. At least things are looking up. My marriage won't be loving, but from our correspondence and occasional meetings, Hashirama seems alright. A bit younger than I'd prefer sure, but I can make this work. Yes, away from Yuzushio I have a chance. Away from this madness, I can be happy. Significantly more cheerful, Mido enters the boat, eager to leave and begin the tedious journey to her awaiting betrothed. Ten days after Shiroyuki, placing a revised version of Mido's writings with the rest of her pack belongings, Shiroyuki is pleased. That was exquisite work Ryaiji. Sharing our memories of our Kaiyu and the template sword was cruel, but effective. Shiroyuki said approvingly. Tossing his head back exaggeratedly, Ryaijin grins. His self-satisfaction is apparent. A, the perks of our eyes. What better way to break her morale than paranoia and psychological damage? I know we had to ensure she drove off her staff and escort, but I didn't expect her to kill them pausing, Ryaiji shakes it off. Well, whatever, Gondori's scales made sure their death was painless. Ryaiji watched as his brother's Luna Moth summon is dismissed. More importantly brother, the seal is on her person, right we double checked. You tease me about Yukine, I think it's only Fa Shuroyuki cuts him off. Don't get cute with me, of course I verified. A spare too, mixed in with her things. Even if this caravan is looted, at least one will be left behind. Due to the seal's simplicity, anyone with even the slightest understanding will see what the overlay does. Shuro replied. Asserting his authority as the eldest. Sure Shuro, but the details and diagrams in her journal make it all the more damning. This plus the other gifts we've been slipping into Yuzushio Ah, I'd feel sorry for Aika, but that would require caring in the first place. Fair enough Rei, Mido is nothing. Oh to be a fly on the wall when Kaiyu finds this how will he react, Shiroyuki mused in curiosity. This leaves shame by completely and rushed to cover for his scheming power-hungry wife, who knows Shiro. It's his daughter and we were never here. Riaiji mocked. Yes indeed, anyone can vouch for it. I see why we would be suspect, but how can we possibly be involved? Shadow clones what are those they haven't been invented and with Taburama dead, he won't be creating them at all. Shiro responded playfully. Yes indeed Shiro, we were very busy at the festival, entertaining foreign dignitaries at the daimyo's side. Such hard work, building alliances to further wins interest and solidifying pre-existing ties. MMHM, Shiro hummed in agreement. As expected, our dear Saku's performance was another triumph. The albino peacock gown was a splendid investment. The golden tear shapes along the side made an even more stunning image than usual. I'm worried she'll be fighting them off with a stick. Too far brother. Riaiji rebuked. Yukina and Rasa will protect her. What can I say little brother much like your vessel is fond of the icy woman from mist, my body has an inclination for dark humor. Six months following Mido Yuzumaki's tragic passing in her sleep, in the manor's waiting area, an uninvited noble sits. His demeanor is patient, the man has one purpose to meet with Sakuya. Sister of the groom and Oasis's suckled wellspring maiden. Though she agreed to speak with him without an appointment, the man knows he must wait until she has time. It's been a few hours. Her errand was at the children's shelter, surely it won't be long now. As if in a queue, the sound of a sliding stone door catches his ears. That wasn't so bad. Standing up and greeting, his expression is affable. Good afternoon. I'm grateful you agreed to speak without prior correspondence. His words were cut off by the unexpected impact of the young woman's appearance. Theoretically, he expected himself prepared, but seeing Sakuya in person, the noble is overwhelmed. So it's true. He whispered. Up close and personal like this, the wellspring maiden is everything the rumors described and more. If anything he feels cheated on her behalf. That the whispers didn't do her justice. Not even close. Was she handcarved by divinity everything about her nothing feels exaggerated, overdone, or without purpose. Every aspect of Sakuya's form it's inhumanly symmetrical. Won't you sit down ask the vision before him. The goddess in human form gestures politely to his seat. The sound of her melodic speaking voice hammering it in all the more. His knees instinctively weaken, and the man wonders if his body is trying to bow. So this is what they mean by a dewdrop-like voice. Thought the noble. 
quickly positioning himself in his seat, the flustered man tries to recover his composure. Uh, yes. Thank you so much for your time. Clearing his throat, after exchanging pleasantries, the man presents Akuya with a small box. Wrapped in a silk cloth, he urges her to accept. A gift for Yukina and Ryaiji, how lovely. I'm sure they'll appreciate it, but I have to inquire why are you entrusting this to me? I don't mind keeping it safe, but my brother's wedding is nearly a month away. Ah, uh, no forgive me, Lady Sakir. Perhaps I wasn't clear. This is for you and your brothers. I'm here on behalf of a friend.